We are in Philippians, so if you're in the New Testament, there's the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and there's Acts, which is the birth of the uh, new church, and then after Acts, Paul starts a series of letters, and in those letters, there's Romans, which is a big book, and then uh, First and Second Corinthians, which are big books, and then right after Second Corinthians, uh, there is the smaller books uh, that Paul wrote, and after or Galatians and Ephesians is the book of Philippians. So hopefully you can find it there in your Bible. We'll also be visiting the book of Acts today, um, but we are a Bible teaching church here at City Church, and uh, one of the most obvious ways is that we teach the Bible is that we walk through books of the Bible uh, regularly, and so we'll be walking through the book of Philippians together uh, for the rest of twenty. Uh, 20. So we uh, look forward to being in uh, this book together. The series title is For Me to Live as Christ, and we'll see uh, what that means as we unpack that uh, week by week. So we're going to start today by doing a little survey, and I need you to hold your hands up high um, if you answer in the affirmative to this question. Who in this room, and you can do it online too, Um, I won't see you online. Um, If I did, that would be weird. Google will see you, but I will not. Um, Who in this room has written or received a personal handwritten letter in the, we'll just say the last six months? A letter. Okay, hold your hand up high. I can see it. Okay, we'll expand it. Who in this room has written or received a handwritten letter or card in the last six months. Hold your hands up really high. So all these people have written or received a hand, keep them up, written or received a handwritten letter or card um, while in prison in the last six (laughs) months. We're not really in a handwriting letter for sure day and age. Um, My middle daughter, Um, Reagan, who moved to uh, Florence, just up the road from where we live, about 45, 50 minutes, um, wrote us all a little uh, letter slash card last week, and it was like, aw, I got a handwritten card and letter from my sweet uh, Reagan. So this is a series that is based on a personal letter from Paul from prison to a church in the city of Philippi. And this is how Paul begins his letter. Paul and Timothy, servants, or the most accurate translation of that is slaves of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This would have been a very customary greeting in Paul's day and age, usually a greeting from a letter, which was their primary means of communication in that day and age, uh, before before Al Gore invented the internet. Um, That was the way that they communicated. Um, And in that customary greeting would be the, uh, some of y'all just, that just joke, just like, some of you got it, some of you didn't. Um, A customary greeting would include the sender, the receiver, the recipient of the letter, and then just some type of brief salutation, which is what we see in these first two verses from Paul. Today, to launch our series, we're going to do some preliminary work that's going to help provide us some background and some context for this letter. So in today's message, there's two important dates uh, for you to keep in mind. There is, and these are approximate dates, there's 51 A.D., and 61 A.D. So 51 and 61. Say those two dates with me. 51 and 61. Now everybody say it. Uh, 51 and 61. Go. So those are our two important dates. So 51 A.D. takes us back to uh, Acts chapter 16. So flip in your Bible. You can hold your place in Philippians. We're going to come back there. But we're going to jump back, bounce back to Acts chapter 16. This is the initial visit of Paul to the city of Philippi. So just some context of what's happening when we reach um, Acts 16. um, Paul's been prompted by the Holy Spirit to head into eastern Macedonia, which would have been a region in that time. It's kind of northeastern Greece now in Europe. Um, So Paul is prompted to head into eastern Macedonia. So Paul and his ministry team, uh, which includes Silas, Luke, and Timothy at this point, they embark on this kind of European tour. It's known in 
New Testament terms as Paul's second missionary journey. So this is his second intentional journey, missionary journey, to take the gospel into places that he has not been. Their very first stop in Acts chapter 6 is the influential Roman colony of Philippi, which is where Acts 16 records three significant events that helped establish the church in Philippi. So let's pick up in verse 11 of Acts chapter 16. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage uh, to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the, and here, this is where the three significant events starts. And on the Sabbath day, We went outside the gate to the riverside. Now, Paul's normal strategy was to go to the synagogues and teach on Sabbath. This lets us know Philippi probably did not have any type of synagogue. So it was, again, a Roman colony, heavily influenced um, by Rome. Um, A lot of the people that lived there would have been Gentiles. And so uh, on the Sabbath day, they go outside the gate to the riverside where we suppose there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. And so Lydia was probably a Jewish proselyte. Uh, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you had judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed on us. So Significant event, number one, Paul and his companions meet Lydia. Lydia is this entrepreneurial importer and seller of purple, which would have been a very expensive fabric in that day, very exclusive. And so no doubt um, from all indications, she is wealthy. She is God-fearing. She is a Jewish proselyte. And Paul leads her and her whole household to faith in Christ by the river and baptizes her. So Significant event number one, verse 16, number two. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. And I love this part of the text. Paul having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. So Paul exercises this demon, right? A demon-possessed psychic slave girl. He exercises a demon out of this slave girl because... He's annoyed by her. What? So after all these days of walking around, and what she's saying is like gospel, like these guys proclaim the gospel, the way of salvation. And after many days, Paul is so annoyed that he turns and like rebukes the demon, like come out of her. I'm tired of listening to you. You are annoying me. It's probably a good thing I do not have this spiritual gift. Ashley seems to think that a lot of people in the world annoy me. I don't know why she thinks that. It was probably a good thing I do not have this gift. Or I would be casting demons out of annoying people. There's a spiritual truth here that to be annoying means to be demon possessed. Um, (laughs) You are annoying me. Now, obviously, the owners are displeased with this because they have lost their primary source of cash flow. And so if you go on to read the text from this act of kindness, casting a demon out of a psychic slave girl, this act of kindness results in this missionary team being dragged before the local magistrates. They're accused of causing a disturbance and introducing a foreign religion. From there, they are stripped of their clothes, beaten with rods, and thrown into a dungeon. All because Paul got annoyed. (laughs) No. Um, So that's the result of casting the demon out of the slave girl. So significant event number two. Keep track. Lydia, rich entrepreneurial lady, saved, baptized by the river. 
Significant event number two, slave girl, demon exercised out. Paul's thrown in jail into the dungeon part. As a result, let's pick up with Paul in prison. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Why would you not when you're in stocks in a dungeon? Paul is singing and praising, uh, singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. And when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before uh, Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. That's one of the simplest explanations of salvation in all the Bible. Believe in Jesus and you will be saved. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their wounds. He was baptized at once, he and his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. So Paul and Silas's reaction to being thrown into prison, to being placed in stocks, Pray and sing. Makes sense? Pray and sing. By the way, at midnight. Not sure that, I'm not sure that's the wisest move when you're surrounded in a dungeon by a bunch of hardcore criminals to decide to praise Jesus at midnight. But that's what happens. And God responds by sending an earthquake to open the doors of the prison and to unshackle the prisoners. As a result of this, the jailer sees what's happening and the jailer is shook. See what I did there? Earthquake. Jailer is shook. Um, the, the jailer is shaken by what's taking place. He assumes the prisoners have escaped. Of course he does. And he decides it would be better to end his own life than to face the cruelty of the Roman prison officials. But Paul stops him and assures him everyone is still here. I kind of get Paul and Silas are still there. I don't really get the rest of the criminals while they stuck around. Like, I guess that's Paul's influence in the prison in that short window of time. Well, the jailer is overwhelmed. He invites this missionary prison praise band to his house to attend to their wounds and to feed them dinner. And of course, Paul proceeds to lead the jailer and his entire household to faith in Jesus, and he baptizes them. The next day, if you go on to read the rest of the story, the next day the magistrates decide to let Paul go. And so the apostle and his gospel posse, they leave uh, the city of Philippi. They head for the next stops on the missionary journey, which was Berea and Thessalonica and Athens. And so Paul heads out on his way. But I love this part of the story. You can take time to read it on your own in the rest of Acts 16. He does not leave before he asks for an apology from the magistrates for the way they treated him. You know why? Paul was a Roman citizen. Roman citizens were not to be treated the way Paul was treated. And so they're, hey, like, Paul, we're going to let you go. Paul said, that's great. I would love to be set free, but I'm not leaving until I receive an apology for how you treated a Roman citizen. Bam! Left gut punch, right? Anyways, Paul leaves, and from this ragtag group of fresh Jesus followers, a wealthy woman and her household, a demon-possessed slave girl, and a blue-collar jailer and his family, a church is birthed. And a bond is formed between Paul and and this young, fledgling group of Jesus followers. If you read the rest of the narrative of Paul, Paul maintains contact with the church in Philippi. He visits with them again on his third missionary journey. The church sends financial support to Paul. They send an offering to the struggling church of Jerusalem when they were in need. And so that's A.D. 51. A.D. 61, we fast forward 10 years 
Paul finds himself in prison again. Kind of a common theme in the ministry of Paul. Paul finds himself in prison again. This time he's in Rome. He is awaiting trial before Caesar that could result in his execution. He seems to be under house arrest. There's no doubt he's being watched by the elite uh, Praetorian guard, Roman guard, uh, which another text tells us he led many of them to faith in Christ as well. Uh, But from all indications, Paul would have been chained to a Roman guard. Man, don't you feel sorry for that guy? The guy that's like chained to Paul. Particularly if the guy that's chained to Paul is not a believer in Jesus. Like, can you imagine being chained to Paul and not being a follower of Jesus? Now, you will be glad when your shift is over and the next guy comes in. Uh, But Paul is chained to a Roman guard. He does have a good bit of flexibility. Um, He can receive visitors, we read. Um, He does some teaching and preaching during this time. And he does letter writing, uh, which is what we have. So when the Philippian church hears about Paul's imprisonment in Rome, they respond by sending one of their key leaders, a guy named Epaphroditus. Feel free to name your kids that, those of you that are going to have kids. Epaphroditus, they send one of their leaders to Rome. He has this kind of monetary gift to help supply uh, for Paul's needs. When he gets to Rome, Epaphroditus becomes sick and almost dies. So he gets really sick, almost dies. Word gets back to the Philippian church that Paph, Epaphroditus, has COVID, and they all go into quarantine. I'm sorry, that was AD 2020. I had a moment right there. I just lost track of what's going on. They hear that Epaphroditus is sick. Word gets back to them. Obviously, they're very concerned uh, for one of their church leaders. But eventually, Epaphroditus returns to health. And Paul sends him back. Here we go. Paul sends him back to Philippi with the letter you are now holding in your hands almost 2,000 years later. We're holding the letter that Paul wrote 2,000 years later. So now you can kind of begin to see how this story is unfolding. And Philippians is this personal letter that is filled with genuine warmth, irrepressible joy. Paul uses the word joy or rejoice 14 times in this short letter. In this letter, he pushes the Philippians toward unity. He warns against false teachers. He speaks about God's work in times of suffering while he sits in a Roman prison. Unlike most of his other epistles, there's no kind of strong rebuke. There's no deep theological treatise in the book of Philippians. The book is very relational. Um, One commentator labeled it theology in street clothes. I like that. Um, Theology in just ordinary street clothes. And centuries later, centuries later, we have the opportunity to walk through this letter written between friends and to seek to bring Paul's words into our local gathering of Jesus followers. And so we do so. We proceed cautiously. We enter into this world with care, right? We want to make sure that what Paul was saying to the Philippians, we understand and we bring it into our context so that we might understand how we bridge the Word of God some 2,000 years later. So let's just unpack these first two verses, and that's as far as we'll get today, which doesn't say give us a lot of hope for our pace through the rest of the book, I know, but I promise you we'll make it through by the end of the year. Um, Paul and Timothy, servants, or according to what your translation is, it may say slaves, it might say uh, bond servants, some translations say Paul and Timothy, servants, slaves, bond servants of Christ Jesus. Paul identifies himself and Timothy as servants or slaves of Jesus Christ. Now, let's be really 
honest right now. The term slave does not have a positive connotation in our cultural climate. And let me be quick to say, nor should it. Nor should it. Slavery is a dark and terrible stain in our history books. And it's one that needs to be recognized. Um, It's one that we repent of that it ever occurred, right? And let's also be quick to say, tragically, that many who profess the name of Jesus not only failed to stand against the sin of slavery, but often participated in the continuation of it, okay? So let's not be fooled into thinking that our history doesn't say anything different than that. I just got through reading the uh, life and narrative of the abolitionist uh, Frederick Douglass, and I was taken back in Douglass's words that he said the people that treated him the worst as a slave were religious people. His worst owners were religious people that professed the name of Jesus. And so we do not use this term slavery lightly. Paul utilizes this term, and we must recognize that when we talk about this term, we're in no way that Paul is in no way endorsing the sinful practice of slaveholding. He is simply referring to the idea that he is owned by someone else. He is owned by Jesus, that Paul is a slave of Jesus Christ, that he has no rights, that he is owned by Jesus, and he is entirely at the disposal of King Jesus. So there is no cause for concern in the idea in Paul's mind that he's owned by Jesus because the apostle is in service to a king who is good and gracious. He is a good and gracious king. The word slave implies humility and involves submission. Paul will use this same word later in his letter when he reminds us that Jesus took on the form of a servant when he humbled himself and descended from heaven and was crucified on a cross, that he took on the form of a servant when he did that. And so Paul identifies himself as a slave of Jesus, as a servant of Jesus Christ. And then his audience here, that's the writer of the letter, his audience is the rest of verse 1, to all the saints who are in Christ Jesus, who were at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. And so he writes to the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. Any saints in the house, right? Paul must be writing in our minds to some super spiritual elite ninja Christians to call them saints. No. Paul includes an important three-letter word here. To, what's that next word? All the saints in Christ Jesus. A-L-L. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are a saint. Here's what that word means. You have been called out and set apart by God for his purposes. The key to understanding this idea of being a saint is not because of how saintly I am to all the saints, what? In Christ Jesus. In Jesus, we are holy. In Jesus, we are righteous. In Jesus, we are saintly. We are righteous, not because we are so righteous, but because He is so righteous and we are in Him. We are holy, not because we are so holy, but because Jesus was absolutely holy and we are in Him. We are saintly, not because our lives appear so saintly all the time, but because Jesus was perfect and righteous. And in Jesus, we are saints before God. The Father. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are a saint. So if you're a follower of Jesus today, say, In Jesus, I am a saint. In Jesus, I am a saint. Paul writes to the saints, and by the way, we have been set apart to him and for him. 
We have been set apart for relationship with Jesus. We have been set apart for fellowship with Jesus. The, the Westminster Abbey says that, that we have been set apart to glorify and enjoy Him forever. That we find our delight in God. That you were created to find your delight in God. That we are His people, that we are his treasure, that we are his possession, that we are the people of God. We are the saints of God. So when Paul writes to the church of Philippi, he writes as a servant, as a slave of Jesus. And he writes to saints in Jesus. He, he writes to the saints in the church of Philippi. He writes to the saints in the church of City Church in Decatur, Alabama. He writes to the saints. And so we pay attention because we are the saints of God. And then verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. To this group of saints and slaves, Paul extends the grace and peace of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is that unearned, undeserved favor of God. Peace is that inner well-being of the soul that flows out of God's grace. That grace and peace are provided by God. They are embodied by Jesus. I mean, what a way to start a letter. So let me highlight just a couple of important concepts in Paul's writing here that will be important throughout our series. One thing I want to make note of and while we went back to Acts chapter 16 is because we need to be reminded when we approach a book like Philippians that God's, we need to be reminded of God's plan to advance the gospel and to build his church. It is important to understand the backstory of this letter so that we remember that the gospel is advanced and the church is built through servants of the king proclaiming the good news. There is a church in Philippi because Paul went to Philippi and proclaimed Jesus to everyone. He advanced the gospel where God placed him. The church of Philippi existed because Paul looked for opportunities to share his faith. I love the phrase in Acts chapter 16. We won't go back there, but in verse 14 in the telling of the story of Lydia, you might have noticed when we were reading the text, this phrase, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Here's what that means for us as proclaimers of the gospel. We share the gospel. God opens hearts. You understand that? I've told you that again and again. The burden of, this, of, of evangelism and sharing the gospel, so many times we put the burden on us. Like, they're, they're not going to believe. I'm going to say the wrong thing. They're going to ask questions I'm uncomfortable with. What are they going to think about me? But again and again and again, what we see is it is our role, our mandate, our responsibility, our opportunity to share the gospel. And God does his supernatural work in the lives and hearts of people. It wasn't up to Paul to convince Lydia to become a believer. It was up to Paul to proclaim the gospel and allow God to do his work. It's why we say over and over the church belongs to Jesus. It is his church. It is why Jesus said, I will build my church. Now you go and proclaim. You go and announce. The gospel is advanced. The church is built as the servants of the king are faithful to obey our mandate. Go make disciples, baptize them, teach them. And I'm with you, Jesus said. That's how the church is built. That's how the gospel is advanced. That's why we're reading the book of Philippians today. God's plan to advance the kingdom, to build the church. Another thing that we need to just introduce this series with is going to be important as we go through it. I want to remind us today that genuine joy, true joy, is not circumstance-driven. It's not based on our circumstances. This is going to be so important um, throughout this series. The, one of the primary themes and keys of the entire book 
is this idea of joy or rejoicing. We are a culture that is consumed with happiness. It is written into our constitution even. Um, I, I, I find it interesting how we, our forefathers phrased it though, that we are guaranteed the pursuit of happiness. You know what they can't guarantee? Happiness. Can't be guaranteed. They can all, the, the best they could offer is like, hey, you can pursue happiness. Go for it. Right? You can chase happiness. You can pursue it because there's no guarantees when it comes to happiness. And we are a culture that is filled with self-help and motivational speakers and life coaches that basically say to you, control your circumstances and you will dictate your happiness. Control your circumstances and you'll dictate your happiness. And Paul comes along and sounds a completely different tune because he's writing from prison. He's writing with his life on the line. He's writing in a very uncomfortable position. He can't control his circumstances. And he writes that we are to live lives that are filled with joy. Paul speaks not about happiness, he speaks of joy. Because joy is the established belief that God is sovereign. And he is sovereign and in control over all of life. And he is working all things for his glory and for my good. No matter the circumstances, no matter what is going on, that I can have joy because joy is grounded in the belief God's got this. And this joy, Paul will say, is available for Jesus followers. As a matter of fact, we are instructed by the time we get to chapter 4 to rejoice. Paul emphasizes it. Rejoice. And again, I say rejoice, Paul says. And we'll unpack that idea in this series. The last thing I want to remind us of in this introduction is that we are slaves of a good and gracious king. We are servants of a good and gracious king. We are owned by Jesus if we are followers of Jesus. We are owned by Jesus who bought us with the ultimate price, Paul would say in another text. That he bought us with his own blood. And we are called to be willing devoted, and faithful servants of our King. Hear me clearly when I say this. The highest title that you can hold as a believer in Jesus is slave of Jesus. The highest title that we can hold is servant of of Jesus. We relate to this concept because here's our reality. We have been enslaved to things, haven't we? You ever been enslaved to a sin? You ever been held captive by an addiction? You ever been held captive by a desire and a need for relationships in your life, no matter what they look like or how bad they might be or how you're treated? But you have, you're held captive, you're a slave to the need for human relationships. You ever been held captive by money? You ever been enslaved to what people think about me? To put it in kind of our modern culture terms, you ever been held slave to likes? We, we get the concept. To be owned by something. Because here's what the scriptures teach in the overall redemptive story of scripture. And we'll see this next year when we get into the book of Exodus. What the scriptures teach from beginning to end is that we are held captive by something, by someone. That our hearts are naturally prone to something or someone that has ownership over our lives. 
The Old Testament term for that that Paul brings into the New Testament is the idea of idolatry, that I am bending my knee to something or someone in my life, that I am being held captive by something or someone in my life. And that something or someone that holds us captive dictates how we use our time, how we use our treasures, how we use our money. And Paul comes along and announces, I am a slave of Jesus. We are owned by Jesus who bought our freedom with his own blood. Notice I said he purchased our freedom with his own blood. To be owned by Jesus is to be liberated from the control of everything and everyone else. To be owned by Jesus is to be set free from the captivity of every other sin, every other person, every other drive, every other passion, because I am owned by Jesus. He has purchased my freedom. And when we recognize and embrace who we are in Jesus, that we are slaves of the Almighty, that we are saints in Jesus, it begins to put life in perspective for us. Here's what that means. I don't own my time. Who owns it? He owns it. I don't own my money. Who owns it? He owns it. I'm a steward of it. I don't own these talents I've been given, these gifts that I have. He owns them. They're his gifts. They're his talents. We saw how that goes crazy with someone like Samson who thought all of his gifts were about him, right? And when we recognize that we are slaves of Jesus, we don't own stuff. I don't own the decisions that I make. He owns them. Here's where it gets personal. I don't own my kids. They belong to Jesus. They're his I'm not that important, but he is. John said it this way, he must constantly increase and I must constantly decrease. And by the way, ownership is not a bad thing when your king is good and gracious. Our king is not cruel, he's not capricious, he is not unstable, he is sovereign, he is virtuous, he is kind, he is the opposite of every other master. Our king can be trusted. Think about it. Paul is in prison. He is waiting on Caesar to determine his earthly outcome. Live or die, it is up to Caesar. Paul may look like a victim. He may look like a prisoner. He may look like a slave of Caesar. But Paul says, I'm not. I am a slave of Jesus. If I am in prison, it is because God wants me here. He is in control. Caesar is not in charge. God is in charge. That's why the important concept of this entire book and this series is Paul's words, for me to live is Christ. And the rest of that statement is, for me to die is gain. Caesar's not in control of my life, Paul says. God is in control. If I live, I will live as a slave of Jesus. If I die, that's to my advantage. I have heaven to gain. I want to warn you right now. This type of faith living I'm talking about, it's dangerous. It's dangerous because it will change your life perspective. If you begin to live with this mindset, look out. If you begin to see yourself as a slave of Jesus, be careful. Because here is what that means. God, I'm in a terrible place in life right now. God, I am in a very confusing season of life. I don't understand what's going on right now. God, I'm in a miserable stage of life right now. 
But I believe you are in control and you have a plan for me. A plan to bring glory to you. A plan that is for my good. I am not a victim. I am not a servant to someone else. And if you have me in this place, as miserable as it is, as confusing as it is, as terrible as it is, God, if you have me here right now, there's a reason that is bigger than what I can see and what I can understand. So, God, if you have me here, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to sing in the heart of the dungeon. I'm going to rejoice in my suffering. I'm going to worship in the pain. I am going to praise you when life has me in stocks and I can't see a way out because you are a good and gracious king and I am your servant. Circumstances do not own me. You are in control and I belong to you. You are my good and gracious king and I am your servant. So in this difficult season, in this time of trial, in this pain and suffering, in this time of uncertainty. I'm not going to beat myself up. I'm not going to live as a victim. I'm not going to allow my circumstances to own or control me. I belong to Jesus and I'm going to rejoice even in spite of my circumstances. And if you think that's about self-help and saying the right thing in front of yourself in the mirror, you've missed the gospel behind it. Because the gospel said, you're a slave of Jesus. He has bought you with a price. It's not my time, it's his time. It's not my money, it's his money. They're not my kids, they're his kids. I've been given the opportunity to manage it, to steward it, to choose what I do with it, right? Right? God's not going to come down and pull it out of my account and be like, oh, no, this is mine. He has appointed me as a manager and steward of it, but at the end of the day, I am his slave. I am his. Circumstances do not own me. He is in control, and I belong to him. So, I invite you. I invite you on this journey through Philippians as we discover where true joy is found. Not the pursuit of happiness. As we discover where true joy is found, as we discuss how the gospel is advanced and how the church is built, ready for it? The church is built by slaves and saints. Welcome to the book of Philippians.